Good morning, world, and uh, welcome to another Tandatula Sofa Safari from a chilly Timbavati. And you might think I say that all the time, but it really is chilly today. It must be about seven degrees at the moment. Um, so us little uh, low felt boys are struggling a bit because this is like, in your terms, about minus twenty for us because we're not used to it being this cold. Um, you've got me again for your uh, guide for this episode. Um, it was really because my mom emailed the producers and said she doesn't see enough of me on TV, so she wanted to see me more. So here I am again. Uh, since my episode a few days ago, uh, with all those leopards, we've had a lot of lions. Um, so the river pride and the Nara males have been very evident. So um, we're going to be making that our plan for the morning. Uh, although it feels like we say that quite often and then don't end up showing you the lions, I have a feeling about today. So come along and uh, let's go find some lions. up tracks for the River Pride. They are, well, can only see tracks for the males and the females at the moment heading along the Sharalumi. And uh, as we're driving, checking, we've come across this big buffalo bull who has got an early start to the day. Uh, quite often these old guys, early mornings like this when it's so bitterly cold, just lie up chewing the cud. But uh, for some reason this guy's decided to get his Friday going with uh, a good bit of grazing. And uh, why not come along these riverbeds? Okay, and we've said it many times before, but the soil conditions and the moisture content here allows the grasses to stay greener, um, and it is often the best grazing uh, for things like zebras and impalas. Impalas, I've got very cold on the mouth. Zebras and impalas are quite a dangerous place to come and uh, graze because of the dense uh, thickets on these riverbeds. But when you're an animal that weighs 850 kilograms and has an attitude that would make Chuck Norris nervous, uh, you can afford to come and feed you without issue. Well, generally without issue. seeing Foreman's episode with all of his elephants, um, I realized that I felt like a bit of a failure for not having found any on my last sofa safari. So it would not be a winter sofa safari without a uh, sight of these gentle giants. Quite a sizable herd that's uh, also feeding here along the edges of the Sharalumi. Beautiful morning light catching them. Um, not an ideal location for us because uh, it means that they have likely walked on top of all of our lion tracks that uh, were still going up the road straight through the middle of the herd. The fact that this herd is so calm means that they haven't had any encounters with lions. Um, what is often quite evident in elephants when they have, um, I don't know if they've attacked, but just encountered predators. They do react very, very strongly when they see predators, but it will often cause uh, liquids to be released from their temporal gland and uh, none of these individuals are showing any sign of that so they haven't been stressed or excited in the last uh, while probably during the course of the night so uh, not good for our lion search but uh, we will keep on trying a herd of elephants that clearly hasn't gone to the dent for a while and, uh, interestingly shaped tusks in this cow in view now and uh, you may just see another white tusk poking out by her armpit, that's her uh, calf having a drink of milk. Now the mum has actually stopped to feed. And then there's another female who's going to possibly come through shortly. He's also got some skewed tusks. 
quite often this is just a genetic trait. Sadly, the last time I tracked them in this very route, I didn't find them, but uh, yeah, they're creatures of habit. So, come along the road and then there's this game path, and uh, I thought, let me just check, because last time they did that, and they've done it again. So, we're going to cut through on the other side of the block and see where they come out. I'm going to stop talking about finding lions in these episodes because it hasn't proven very fruitful again this morning. Um, we were on tracks for them and then actually one of the other landowners is driving around this morning as well. They're not far from where we had the tracks. He did pick up one of the Naru males but uh, it was the limping one and he wasn't in any mood to hang around so he moved off into a thicket um, and we didn't want to disturb him anymore. Uh, plenty of elephants, some more buffaloes. I mentioned that the guy feeding in the early hours of the morning on the riverbank was a bit unusual this is what they're normally doing but, uh, there's three boys that are chilling here chewing the cud um, enjoying some of the warming rays of the sun and then when it warms up a bit they will actually go and uh, do some more grazing quite different from how they spend most of the year getting the feeding done early and then resting in the heat of the day it's kind of switched for a, a few weeks now in the middle of winter uh, but we about to come at me. Uh, we're still in the area looking for some lions um, or anything uh, so uh, we haven't given up just yet but uh, it's proving a little bit more difficult than expected but we'll, we won't give up yet. Over. A bird I've been wanting to show on sofa safaris for some time now but they don't tend to sit still for very long. You will probably have guessed from all that chirping that it is a parrot. This is one of our indigenous local species, in fact the only parrot species that we get in this part of the Great Kruger area, called a brown-headed parrot. Uh, the easiest time for us to see them is normally during the fruiting season when there's plenty of uh, fruits and seeds around that they'll actually spend time on a tree feeding on it, uh, particularly things like our long-tailed cassia, our weeping boar beans that produce all the nectar in their flowers, that really draws the parrots in. In fact, I've read that the, the weeping boar bean in particular has been known as a drunken parrot tree because they are claimed to go and uh, feed on the fermenting nectar in the flowers and because it's been sitting there producing alcohol, the parrots eat that and act drunken after they've eaten it. But uh, that sounds like a long-tailed story for me. Uh, I don't believe it. I've never seen it. And, but who might I say, I've never been drunk myself either. Impala rams nervously coming to drink. But far less fussy about their water than elephants. If that was elephants, I'd be going straight for that inlet trough. Um, this red impala dam, which is one of our uh, pans that are supplemented with water throughout the year. So now that it is starting to dry. Um, we will uh, top it up with a little bit of water and that's what you can see and, and hear coming through by the trough, our mini version of Victoria Fall. Um, elephants would be straight in there drinking that clean, clean water straight out of the ground. These impalas are far less concerned by that. A good little time of morning to see the birds coming down to drink. We've got some golden breasted buntings there, some yellow fronted canaries. Here the blue wax balls in the bush. I'm sure they will come and drink shortly too. Green winged patilia. And our blue wax balls arriving down now too. Another good example of what has been discussed with birds before called allelomimetic behavior and it's where the behavior of the group is sometimes influenced by the behavior of one individual. So if one individual flies down to drink, then others will come and drink with it. If one flies away, then they all fly away.
stunning colours on that uh, green winged patilla there. Reds and greens and greys. Hoping that this means that the game has started to uh, defrost and wake up. Our first <laughs> non buffalo or elephant of the morning. It is a beautiful male giraffe who is watching us very curiously um, and chewing the cud. With this rumination process, you see how he chews, 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 and chews swallows and then if you look closely you'll actually see how that next bolus of food, the next ball of food gets shot up from his uh, first chamber of his stomach, the rumen, and uh, back up to the mouth to be chewed again. As this process continues and the food gets broken down further and further it will pass into the different chambers of the stomach and stop coming through uh, the rumination process and it just increases the surface area of that food so that the microorganisms in the gut can break it down more efficiently. And um, you can see when you look at their droppings just how efficient they are uh, of all of these ruminants, your impalas, your vildebeest, your giraffes, very, very finely ground um, material that is excreted and uh, they extracting almost all of the nutrition from the food that they eat. We've come to talk about uh, acacias, or well, actually the fact that they are no longer acacias. I know Luke has brought it up and uh, bemoaned the fact that the Australians are now the rightful owners of the term acacia, but just a little bit more about that. Um, for a long time, uh, acacia is a very broad genus of plants, uh, typically referring to those that have these thorns and compounded leaves. Uh, were found across uh, the Americas, Africa, into Asia and Australia and they were all treated as one group. But as technology advanced and we could do molecular studies as to the histories of these plants, it was found that the acacia genus uh, was actually something that we call polyphyletic, um, which on the tree of life, if you could imagine, let me see if I can actually do this, um, you get all these branches of how species have speciated over time um, and when you're trying to classify you want this branch to contain only closely related individuals with the same name and if you are able to include just that branch in the grouping we call it monophyletic all of the ancestors of that group are grouped together uh, but if you have a grouping where you've got a genus like acacia that's got members on this branch of life and also members on this branch of life, you're grouping them across two separate splits in uh, their evolutionary history and we call that polyphyletic and the way that they are trying to sort out classification is to avoid these polyphyletic groupings uh, and this happened with the acacias. They realized that the acacias that were growing in Australia were on a different evolutionary route from the uh, acacias that we're finding in Africa. That's not controversial, they accepted that, that was fine. The problem was in the naming. The way that uh, tradition works with nomenclature um, is that you get something called the type specimen, which was the first species described of that genus, and that tends to stick. And I'm holding in my hand the type specimen of acacia trees. This is Acacia nilotica, or the scented thorn or scented podthorn, which you all can see nicely now. Not a particularly big and impressive acacia in these areas, but it was the one that was first described Give me, I think the date was in the 1750s somewhere, but uh, this was acacia. It had the thorns. The um, derivative of um, the word acacia is reference to the thorns, but they get yellow flowers, they get seed pods. In Australia, you also find acacias, not with thorns, but the same type of leaf structure, the same pods, the same flowers. Um, we call our, as a generic term, we call our, or colloquial term, we'll call ours acacias, but in Australia they call them wattles. So, Africans, because we have the type specimen and because we use it in our colloquial language, feel like we are the rightful owners of the term acacia. 
Um, the original botanists that tried to rectify this said that that's fine. Um, these ones can stay as acacias. We will rename some of the others and we'll rename the ones that are found in Australia to Racosperma, uh, which is not a great name, especially not for your national plant. Um, the other thing that wasn't great was that by renaming them that way, you would have had to have renamed over 900 species of acacia that were found in Australia or the former um, acacia that were found in Australia. And this was going to be a, quite a tedious uh, task. So what the um, what was voted at the International Botanical Council conference in 2005 in Vienna was they proposed that rather than keeping the type specimen as the African Acacia nilotica, we give a new type specimen from Australia, one of the wattles. Um, call that the acacia and then rename the African ones. This was a proposal. People were then asked to vote. Um, you needed a majority of 60% to vote against this. Uh, and unfortunately, I think only 54% of the people voted against it. So the majority didn't want the change. They wanted acacia to stay with Africa and Australians to get racosperma. But because it wasn't the 60% that had been stipulated, the change of name stood. Uh, this caused a lot of controversy in the plant world, carried on uh, for another few years, and then in 2011 they decided to re-vote again. Uh, you had to be present to vote, but unfortunately the conference was held in Australia, in Melbourne. So of course the Australians liked this idea, they didn't have to go and rename everything. And as a result, in 2011 it was finally decided that Australians kept acacias and the African genera that were... Where's my branch? Right there that had to be split between these types of acacias and those types of acacias would forever be renamed and we now no longer have acacias in Africa. There's some in Madagascar, so not mainland Africa, but on the continent of Africa no more acacias. We now have two separate groups. The one in my left hand side are now known as Bacchelias. They've got these long straight thorns almost like a V, that's how you can remember it for those people that care. Uh, the V for Vachelia can be uh, the V of the thorn. And then the ones that have got the more rounded hook thorns are known as Senegalia. So I'm holding a knob thorn in my right hand. This is now Senegalia nigrescens, where it used to be Acacia nigrescens. But they've got these very sharp uh, backwards curving thorns. Uh, it's not just those thorns, it's also the flower shape. Uh, these um, Senegalia tend to have long flowers, long fluffy yellow flowers, whereas the Bacchelias tend to have more ball shaped flowers. Yellow in this case and powdery yellow in this case. But that is the story. So yes, we are moaning at the Australians because they took it, but it was voted on. It was a, a long process. It caused a lot of controversy. But at the end of the day, what's in the name? We have just got to adjust and accept that uh, we have two very different genuses here. And um, we'll maybe get into it at some other point. But it's not just about name. It's about the understanding of the, the, the way that these trees fit together because if they're all actually part of the same genus, we shouldn't really find them living together in the same environment because they would typically outcompete each other. But the fact that we can find both of these trees growing almost next to each other shows that they are actually not just different by name, but just different by their uh, ecological niches too. So there we go. Now you know the whole controversy behind the acacia turnips. Copy. And that's it. I'm going to be driving a new road. Yay yeah, me. Um, doesn't often happen when you've been working in a reserve for so long that you get new roads, but uh, they've decided on this property to open a track in the Sharalimi River. Um, that's a few kilometers long and there are such wonderful places to drive and to see. Uh, and I'm very, very excited to go spend uh, the next 15, 20 minutes driving down the Sharalimi River. So uh, enjoy a probably slightly sped up version of it, but hopefully we'll be able to stop and show you a lion or a leopard along the way. Not holding thumbs, but uh, let's see.
one nice thing that we've just come across is one of these sheer rock faces on the outer edge of the river. You can just firstly imagine the force of water that over many, many millennia has been able to actually carve through this rock to get this river to follow its course. But you can see how there are two different uh, rock types here. Uh, it looks like it's more of a granite on our right hand side with the white lines being the um, quartz intrusions. Uh, but then there's this darker rock that's come in, an intrusive volcanic rock, maybe a type of, I don't know, dolorite or gabbro or something that's uh, squeezed through there. And uh, you can actually see how the, the neat edge where in the past there would have been a crack in the uh, geology uh, underground and molten lava came through, filled that up and then it's solidified to make this different type of rock. Very, very cool and beautiful. And, uh, still have a tree that's not renowned for growing on rocks but this uh, apple leaf has managed to find a, a substrate to latch onto on this rocky outcrop and grow from it and as you can imagine how many floods this thing has survived and it's still standing Growing out of this thicket here, we have something called a wild melon. Now, it is actually a herb, it's growing on this creeper with these big fluffy leaves. But this is our wild melon. Um, quite distinctive and easy to recognize during the fruiting season, but when it's not fruiting, it just looks like an ordinary creeper. But these quite solid green balls of the pale patches on. Uh, it's really enjoyed by things like kudus and nialas, but that's about the only things I've ever seen eating them. Um, Britt was very eager to know if she could eat it, uh, and uh, the answer was no. She can, but she'll probably be going to hospital or something. Uh, as a general rule of thumb when it comes to fruits, if we see monkeys and baboons eating it, uh, then it's probably going to be safe for human consumption, but if they leave it alone, we should leave it alone. And I have only on the odd occasion found these with a, a bite from a, a primate in it, uh, but very quickly discarded and, and left alone, which tells us that this is not going to be fit for human consumption. But yeah, a wild melon. He shoots, he scores. Normally grow along the riverbeds. Uh, it's a slightly strange place to find it. Uh, most often you'll find them growing in, um, or the art person you notice, is growing in uh, leadwood trees, uh, creeping up the lead, big leadwood trees that you find in the riverbeds. But this somehow, probably um, dispersed by, who knows, birds, kudus, fed on it in the riverbed, come for water at the pan and just defecated and managed to find itself a substrate to grow on. But there we go. But a warthog sow here. I'm just waiting for her to run away, as they normally do. So quite an old abandoned termite mound just behind her. I suspect may have been a place where artworks have previously excavated and has become a home for her and her sounder. There were some others running around. There they are. <laughs> quite a lot more than I expected. About five youngsters have emerged from the grass there. Gentle calls probably coaxing them to come out. A 
and it's not unusual on these colder mornings. Oh, shame, one's got a, quite a bad limp there. Uh, so, not unusual on these colder mornings for animals to start their activities later once it does warm up. But look at those erect manes of hair. And she got a properly broken leg, that one. They look like they were all punk rockers from the 70s of those mohawks. Goodbye. So, quite disappointingly, our uh, lionless run on sofa safaris has continued for another episode. So if you are missing them, make sure that you check out my solo safaris on Instagram because they are there, I promise you. Uh, just not on the days when we come out and film. So I'm wondering if Brittany hasn't been uh, uh, possessed by a lion curse. So drawing all the elephants in, which is great, and had a lovely morning with a lot of smaller things. I'm sure you enjoyed that too. But uh, we will work on getting some lions back here very soon. But until next time, take care, stay safe, and we'll see you all soon. Cheers.